This 911 call starts a chilling story of a wealthy businessman, Seymour Tankliff, and his adopted son, 17-year-old Marty. On September 7, 1988, a seemingly ordinary day in Long Island, New York, Marty Tankliff woke up to a horrifying scene. He found his father in his office, mercilessly beaten and barely clinging to life, and his mother lifeless and without motion in her bedroom. But the story took a shocking turn when Marty pointed suspicion towards the last person anyone suspected. He accused his father's business partner, Jerry Stewerman. But why would a trusted friend be behind this unthinkable crime? But when the investigation deepened, the police found inconsistencies in Marty's story. And then a shocking twist emerged. They told me that your father, they pumped him full of uh, adrenaline and uh, they came out of the coma and he's saying it's you, Marty, you're the one that did it. Marty was shaken to his core and questioned his memory, wondering if he'd blacked out and harmed his parents. But then came another shocker. Marty confessed to killing his parents. There came a point when you tell them what they wanted yeah. to hear. Why would you do that? It was a way to escape the confines of that environment. So what did you tell them? Whatever they wanted to hear. Little did Marty know, this decision would lead to him being locked up for almost two decades. He will spend the rest of his life in jail, which in my view, based on the evidence, is where he belongs. Was Marty a cold-blooded killer or the victim of a twisted miscarriage of justice? I've never arrested an innocent man in my life. I never will, ever. And you know, I always believe that innocent men don't get found guilty. This is the story of Marty Tankliff, a case that will leave you questioning everything you think you know. It was September 7th, 1988, a day that started like any other for 17-year-old Marty Tankliff. He woke up early, excited for his first day of senior year in Beltaire, Long Island. But as he walked through the house, a chill washed over him. Uh, first thing I noticed, which was a little odd, was that all the lights were on. Um, all the lights throughout the house were all on? All the lights were out throughout the house. Uh, and when I woke in my room, I looked outside and I saw lights on, which was, would be unusual. And after that, I started walking into the main area of the house. Um, and noticed that the front door was open. Which the front door was open? Was open a little bit, which was very strange. His heart pounded as he entered his father's office. The sight that greeted him was horrific. And what did you see when you arrived there? Um, my father was there. And where was your father? Sitting in his um, office chair. Can you describe what you saw as you arrived in the room? <sighs> um, a nightmare. His father, Seymour Tankliff, sat in a slump position and his face was marked with blood and bruises. When Marty looked closer, he noticed that a jagged wound cut deep across his neck. There was blood on him. Um, he was gagging, um, which um, I later found out was uh, something he was trying to gag for air. Um, Were his eyes open? I don't remember. Uh -huh. Marty panicked, but he forced himself to stay calm. He dialed 911, his voice trembling as he described the gruesome scene. All right, hold on and I'll connect you. I'm connecting you with the ambulance. Fire rescue stop, Seesaw Drive in Belter. Whoa, 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 I can't hear you. What is it? 33 Seesaw Drive in Belter. 33 Seesaw Drive in Belter. It's off Crooked Oak Road, Belter. Please, my friend. While waiting for help, Marty did everything he could to help his father. He followed everything the 911 instructor told him to do. He gently lifted his father's legs and applied a makeshift bandage. As he worked, 
A terrifying thought crossed his mind. Where was his mother, Arlene Tancliffe? He searched the house, desperately hoping she was unharmed, but soon his worst fears were confirmed. He found his mother in his parents' bedroom, beaten and lifeless, with her throat cut, laying still under the bed. The scene was too much to bear. The weight of the situation, the ruthless attack on his father, now doubled by the sight of his mother, overwhelmed him. He couldn't bring himself to go any closer. At that moment, he realized his entire family, his safe haven, was gone. Driven by raw emotion, Marty ran outside and screamed for help. He frantically called his stepsister, Sherry Mistrella, leaving a message that painted a picture of pure horror. The clock read about 6.15, and I picked up the phone, and Marty was on the other end of the line, and he said, get over here. I said, what's the matter? He said, agitated, not hysterical, agitated. I don't know, something happened to my parents. And he said, I think they're dead. He checked back in on his father, who was still struggling to breathe. In desperate need for help, he called his best friend and then raced to a neighbor's house. Well, he called, uh, hysterically crying and, and saying something happened to his parents, something happened to his parents, and it was, you know, I, I was sleeping, I woke up, and I got this phone, and I didn't know what he was saying, he was hysterical. He needed someone, anyone, to help him understand the unimaginable situation he'd found himself in. It was a combination. It was frightened, um, devastation, confusion. Uh, wasn't really sure if this was reality. When the police from the Suffolk County Police Department finally arrived at the scene, Marty, with blood-stained hands, led them to his parents and explained about moving his father in an attempt to help him. Medical help arrived and attended to his critically injured father and confirmed his mother's passing. In that moment, Marty's world shattered. His once safe haven was now a chilling reminder of the gruesome act that had ripped his family apart. Despite the horror, one question bothered the police. How was Marty absolutely clueless about the whole situation? Shouldn't he have heard the attack, the screams, the struggle? This unanswered question cast a dark shadow over Marty, turning him from a grieving son into a suspect. Why would Marty kill his parents? Why? One of the simplest old things in the world, greed. When I first got to the scene, I believe there were three police officers uh, at the scene. They had the scene taped off. And I no observed a young uh, male uh, sitting on a uh, railroad tie wall uh, partially up the driveway. Uh, and I spoke to the officers about what they had. Uh, I asked them who that person was, and he advised me that he was the uh, victim's son. As the investigation progressed, in a shocking statement, Marty pointed to the last person anyone would have suspected. One of the first things he said to me, as I recall, was uh, actually, I think it was the, almost the very first thing he said to me was, uh, I know who did this. And I, I, was, I remember being taken aback somewhat, and I said, well, how do you know who did this? And he said, because it was my father's business partner. The accusation added another layer of complexity to this already tragic scene. Jerry, his father's business partner, was about to become a central figure in this unfolding nightmare. Um, I said, Jerry Sturman. And why did you say Jerry Sturman? He owed my father a lot of money, and my father's business partnership and relationship was deteriorating. At least, that's what Marty thought would happen at the time. In the aftermath of the horrific discovery, Marty's brother-in-law, Ronald Rother, arrived, offering a comforting presence in the midst of all the chaos. However, before they could exchange even a word, the police intervened, citing the need to avoid contaminating each other's accounts. Marty was then isolated further, left to wait in the back of a patrol car for the detectives. Even a simple request to wash the blood of his own father off his hands was denied by the authorities. Meanwhile, Detective James McCready from the Suffolk County Police Department Homicide Squad arrived at the scene. His initial inspection revealed a chilling reality. Blood was found not only in the office where his father lay, in the room where his mother was discovered, but also in Marty's bedroom. As he turned his attention to Marty, the young man, still processing his shock, repeated his initial statement. Jerry Stewerman, his father's business partner, was responsible. Marty revealed crucial details, including that his father, Seymour, had hosted a late-night poker game just the night before, a gathering that stretched into the early hours of the morning. We know there was a card game that night. We know it went till 3 o'clock in the morning. We know that uh, 
that Stuerman stayed behind to talk with, with Seymour Tankliff. We know that a card player came back in uh, after everybody left and found the conversation was very heated and, and not the type of situation that he wanted to interrupt, um, and he left. Marty insisted that Jerry had been the last one to leave the house. Furthermore, Marty claimed that tensions had been simmering between Jerry and Seymour all summer, and a witness at their shared bagel shop could also testify about their strained relationship. He also told them about his father's ongoing conflict with Jerry over the large sum of money Jerry owed his father. He even suggested they talk to his uncle, Mike Fox, who was also his father's lawyer, and was coincidentally arriving at the scene at that very moment. And when I mentioned Uncle Mike, both their heads turned and looked away. Um, when they looked away, I turned around and I saw my Uncle Mike's car. Um, and I said, and as a matter of fact, there's Uncle Mike now. And you said, there's Uncle Mike. There's and Uncle Mike. Happened? McCready took off running. McCready briefly spoke to his uncle from a distance, and Mike, without a word, got back in his car and drove away. When Marty finally asked about his uncle's sudden departure, McCready simply said they knew where to find Mike if needed. As the day wore on, detectives ruled out robbery as a motive for the attack. The police questioned Marty after they noticed bloodstains on his leg and foot. Marty explained it was from when he tried to help his father. But things soon took a strange turn. Later, Detective McCready would admit that he was suspicious from the start. Marty's calm demeanor, lack of tears, and other seemingly minor details all raised red flags. Uh, we, we brought him over by our uh, police car, and he was sitting... Uh, he was sitting up on the hood of the police car, uh, again, in a very relaxed position, uh, uh, very relaxed mode. An officer claimed he saw Marty washing his hands in a puddle outside, and there was a smudge of blood on his bedroom light switch. Additionally, Marty mentioned checking the garage for his mother's car after helping his father. The lack of blood on the garage door handle, if true, cast further doubt on his story. At what point in your mind did Marty... Tankliff become a suspect in that case? Um, it was about 8, about 8.35 in the morning. And what is it that made him a suspect in your mind? The inconsistencies in the evidence that I saw and the story that he told. Finally, the fact that Marty was the only survivor and so readily pointed the finger at Jerry Stuermeyer fueled the detective's suspicions. These details, however minor they seemed, would cast a long shadow over Marty in the days to come. As the day progressed, Another seasoned detective, Norman Rain, joined the investigation. After tirelessly questioning Marty for a third time, they requested he accompany them to the police station. Marty inquired about stopping at the hospital for a while to check on his father, but McCready supposedly brushed it off, stating it could wait. And at that point, it was when I said to, uh, I don't know if it was McCready, Ryan, or the other, I want to go to the hospital. Uh, McCready's response, will take you there. Never ever once asked to go to the hospital or, or didn't even ask about his father, how he was doing. We ended up actually getting to a point of travel where we were nowhere near the hospital. I said, where are we going? I said, I want to go to the hospital. He said, well, I'll take you there later. He said, but I need to take you to Yapang to get a statement from you. I said, no, I want to go to the hospital. He said, no. He said, we're going to go to Yapang. He said, we need some more information on Jerry Stuerman. Upon arrival at the station, Marty realized, with a growing sense of unease, that he was still barefoot. Um, there were points where I was basically cordoned into a little corner. Um, and there were times that Ryan was on one side of me, had his hands on my knees or my shoulders, and he was trying to comfort me. Um, there were other times that he was up screaming and yelling. Um, there were also times when McCready was on the other side of the desk, screaming and yelling at me. What would they say to you? Um, you know, enough of this already. We know you did it. You know, just tell us you did it. That's all we need to hear. That's all we want to know. Um, but, you know, they weren't the only ones. I can remember, you know, later in the day, I don't know what time it was, uh, I believe it was Sergeant Doyle, you know, who threw me up against the wall. Meanwhile, back at the hospital, Marty's family, desperate for answers, searched for him, completely unaware he was actually at the station instead of by his father's bedside. As family members anxiously awaited news at the hospital, detectives arrived to begin questioning them. Seymour's son-in-law painted a picture of strained relations and financial tension with Jerry, Seymour's business partner. He revealed a hefty debt of $500,000 owed by Jerry with a payment due that very week. Mike Fox, Marty's uncle, chimed in, claiming to have supporting paperwork in his office. Amidst the chaos, the family inquired about Marty's whereabouts. 
They were told he was at the police station assisting detectives with details about Seymour's business dealings, specifically with Jerry. They were assured he'd be brought back to the hospital upon their request. Later, Mike claimed that he was lied to. He said that he was told that Marty was already on his way to the hospital, even though Marty was actually still with the police. The family had initially planned to send someone to the station to be with Marty, but due to a commotion surrounding Seymour's transfer to a new hospital, they all rushed there instead. They believed Marty was only with the police answering routine questions about his father's business partner, Jerry. Under this impression, they prioritized Seymour's well-being and focused on him at the hospital. At the station, detectives questioned Marty about seemingly irrelevant details like the nose job he'd gotten and his family's habits. They eventually shifted focus, asking very specific questions about the night of the murders. Feeling overwhelmed, Marty revealed he was adopted and expressed fear about being alone. Then soon, the questioning at the station intensified. Initially, detectives asked about Marty's father's high-stakes poker games and the family's wealth, hinting he could inherit a fortune. Then their tone shifted, accusing Marty of lacking emotion, having minimal blood on him despite helping his father, and leaving no fingerprints on the light switches. They even claimed to have found his hair in his mother's hand and evidence he'd showered to remove blood. Marty maintained his innocence, insisting he'd found his parents already injured and never showered that morning. Hours ticked by as the detectives grilled Marty with increasingly bizarre accusations. At 12.15 p.m., a phone rang, shattering the tense silence. Detective McCready left the room to answer the call. The detective told him his father had woken up from the coma, but what came next shook Marty to the core. Marty, I said, that was the detective I spoke to before. He's at the hospital. I said, they just told me that your father, they pumped him full of uh, adrenaline, and uh, they came out of the coma, and he's saying it's you, Marty, you're the one that did it. They were saying, my father said I did this. My father never lied to me. The world spun for Marty. His father, the one person who could clear his name, had apparently pointed the finger of blame at him. He pleaded his innocence, suggesting maybe his father was confused from the attack. He even begged for a lie detector test, a lifeline he was cruelly denied. So you're better at telling whether someone's lying? I, I think I'm better than a polygraph machine. As the pressure mounted, the unthinkable happened. Marty, in a moment of shock and confusion, uttered the most chilling words. Could I have blacked out and done it? This unexpected confession sent shockwaves through the investigation. Meanwhile, unaware of the dramatic events unfolding at the station, Marty's uncle and lawyer, Mike Fox, was on his way to gather evidence against Jerry Stuerman, the business partner Marty had accused. Hearing a news report about Marty's questioning, Mike called the station to ensure Marty's safety and request his transfer to the hospital where his family awaited. This call, tragically, came just 30 agonizing minutes too late. By the time Mike Fox followed up, the call was answered with shocking news. Marty Tankliff was under arrest for murder. The young man's pleas of innocence and his request for a lie detector test all fell on deaf ears in the face of the suspicion he faced. As if the situation wasn't devastating enough, the story took another shocking turn just days later. Jerry Stuerman, the man Marty had pointed the finger at, unexpectedly passed away. With Jerry gone, the police investigation lost a crucial piece of the puzzle. Without the ability to question, confront, or gather evidence from Jerry himself, all the focus shifted back to Marty. The case against Marty was now growing stronger. The lack of an alternative suspect, coupled with Marty's confession, further fueled the police's suspicions. But if you think the story ends here, hold on to your seat, because the real journey for Marty Tankliff was just beginning. After Marty's arrest, a lawyer, Bob Gottlieb, was contacted to represent him. I received a call from Mike Fox, who was very close to Seymour uh, Tankliff and the entire family. He called me, I guess, about uh, 1245, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, saying that um, uh, he identified himself, saying that there was a real problem, that Marty, the, the son of Seymour and Arlene Tankliff, uh, was down at uh, Homicide Headquarters, was being questioned, and he was now concerned that they were thinking that he might be a suspect. Uh, he knew of me, and... Uh, I said, stop the conversation, let's hang up as I want to call over. And I went to the 6th precinct that brought me into a small room, uh, that's a sterile room. He was brought in in, uh, in in a paper jumpsuit because they had removed his clothing. And in walks Marty Tankliff, and he looked like a baby. The lawyer advised Marty not to speak to anyone, including his sister. However, the police pressured Marty to talk to his sister and recorded the conversation. 
The next time I actually heard from Marty himself, he was calling me from jail. But I do remember him saying to me, I need you, I need you to be with me. And I said, why? And he said, um, I said, did you tell them you did this? And he said, yes. And I said, why? And he said, I had to. They made me. During the conversation, Marty apologized and said he needed help. Marty's lawyer and family members found the accusations unbelievable, as Arlene, his mother, was known for her strength and wouldn't have gone down without a fight. They also noted the lack of any injuries on Marty, which seemed unlikely if he'd attacked both parents. While Marty hadn't signed a confession, the lack of a video recording created a situation where it was his word against the police. Even before Marty went on trial, the prosecutor, Ed Jablonski, painted a shocking picture, claiming Marty planned the attack and even washed the murder weapons and left them in plain sight to mislead the police. He fabricated motives, twisting petty details like Marty's love for his car, where he claimed that Marty was angry because his parents made him drive a 78 Lincoln instead of his old car. He also stated that Marty held a grudge against his parents because of their cruise vacation, which they went on without him, taking their friends with them instead. The media joined the prosecutor's narrative, turning Marty into a sensationalized villain. News outlets labeled him alongside notorious criminals, increasing the public's bias. His request to attend his mother's funeral, a fundamental right, was initially denied. Luckily, another judge allowed him to attend, but under humiliating circumstances, in handcuffs and shackles. At the funeral, surrounded by guards and isolated from his grieving family, Marty could only sob helplessly. This public portrayal and treatment, despite his unconvicted status, painted a grim picture of what was ahead for Marty. The journey to prove his innocence and reclaim his shattered life had just begun. Marty's world turned upside down on September 14, 1988. Detectives McCready and Rain presented a written story about what happened, claiming Marty himself confessed to a gruesome attack on his parents. The details were horrifying. Planning the attack, using a knife and barbell, then trying to cover his tracks by washing the weapons and staging the scene. The detectives even said he waited for his mother to die before calling 911. Devastated and confused, Marty's family struggled to come to terms with this news. Three weeks after the murders, an unexpected twist emerged that would send shockwaves through the courtroom and rewrite the entire narrative. I believe we found somebody in the hotel that said that he had uh, taken a Winston limousine or gotten, they thought they, somebody that fit his description got into a Winston limousine. Then we checked with the airlines and we found out that we had a, uh, a Jerry Winston who paid cash for his, uh, for his airline ticket. Well, we wanted to know where he was, um, certainly. And uh, we subsequently got some information f that he had called his girlfriend and uh, the police were able to track down where that phone call came from. And so we went out to California, myself and two other two detectives, went out to California to see if we could track him down. Jerry Stewerman, the man initially suspected by Marty and presumed dead, was not only alive, but was found hiding in California under a different identity. I had too many pro problems, and it's just 20 years of building up, that's all. So I staged my death. Jerry confessed to being the last person to leave the tank lift residence on the night of the attack, but he denied any involvement in the crimes. At the point he disappeared, he was, he was not a suspect to the police, although I believe there was some um, people saying that he might be a suspect, but the police did not think of him as a suspect. And, what, and why was that? Well, at that point, they already had the conversation with Mr. Tankliff saying exactly what he had done. And uh, when you have a conversation by that, there's, there's really no reason to think that somebody else is a suspect. However, this only deepened the mystery. If Jerry was indeed telling the truth, why would he not only vanish, but also fake his own death immediately following the murders? The once clear narrative of the case was shattered. The question of who was truly responsible for the horrific crimes that crushed the Tankliff family was now wide open. Jerry, Seymour's business partner, was a flashy character known for his flamboyant lifestyle and questionable business practices. He borrowed heavily from Seymour at high interest rates, using his bagel shop and future ventures as collateral. Jerry struggled to repay the loans, relying on poker winnings and potentially shady activities to make ends meet. As the debt grew bigger, 
Tensions grew between Jerry and Seymour. They started arguing and distrusting each other, and things got even worse when Arlene accused Jerry of hitting on her. However, Jerry denied any wrongdoing. He argued in court that being poor didn't make him a criminal and insisted he had nothing to do with the horrific attack. If Jerry really wanted to get lost, they wouldn't have found him. And, you know, I know that Jerry has in the past done some rather um, crazy things. I remember hearing a story about uh, him chaining himself to, uh, uh, I don't know, if the Social Security office or, or the tax office or something, you know, until, until he got results of something. So I know Jerry was, was, you know, he did crazy things. While authorities publicly downplayed Jerry's disappearance as a stress-induced escape, they, too, had heard the rumors that he wasn't as innocent as he seemed. Jerry himself admitted of faking his death to collect insurance money, yet no charges were filed against him. Meanwhile, the anger and suspicion against Marty grew. Despite his supposed confession, the forensics told a different story. No hairs at the crime scene matched Marty's, and no blood was found on the weapons the police claimed were used. The more the family pressed for answers, the more frustrated they became. Even after re-examining the house, drains included, no evidence linked Marty to the crime. It didn't make sense. How could someone attack their parents and leave no trace in other rooms? Adding to the confusion, Seymour's blood was found where his wife was killed, contradicting the detective's story. The more they investigated, the more the official narrative seemed to crumble. As his father Seymour clung to life in the hospital, Marty's hope faded away with each passing day. Then, on October 6th, the news they dreaded arrived. Seymour had passed away. Marty's family was desperate to give him a proper goodbye, so they tried hard to post bail so Marty could attend the funeral, even if it meant armed guards would be present. Their efforts proved successful as they secured bail, which gave Marty the opportunity to say his final goodbyes. With every dead end and unanswered question, the hope for justice for Marty seemed to shrink. Desperate for answers, the family got themselves ready for the drama that would unfold in the courtroom. On April 23, 1990, the judge picked the jury members, and for the first time since the 1950s, cameras were allowed in the courtroom as Marty's trial commenced. Jerry, Seymour's business partner, was called to the stand. The defense team painted him as a down-on-his-luck guy who made some bad choices due to financial struggles. But the prosecutor questioned Jerry for three days and exposed flaws in his excuses about his debt and his relationship with the Tankliffs. Later, Jerry got upset and admitted to his financial problems, but denied any connection to the murders. Gottlieb also tried to point out Jerry's shady business practices, but Jerry denied everything. When it came to Marty, however, the detectives offered a different story. They didn't have any physical evidence tying him to the crime, but they brought in their own experts who spun things in a different light. They pointed to a tissue with a tiny spot of blood and a wet loofah in the shower, suggesting Marty tried to clean up. An expert even disagreed with Marty's version of events. The detectives then tried to paint a picture of Marty as a cold-blooded killer. They described Marty's confession and even claimed that he gave them details he wouldn't have known unless he was the killer. But they admitted they never seriously interrogated Jerry. Marty himself testified explaining how the detectives fed him details about the crime and pressured him to agree. He insisted he loved his parents and never hurt them. The prosecution, however, focused on a supposed argument with his father and painted a different story of Marty's motive while shifting focus to inconsistencies in his story. He had told me that at one point when he assisted his father that he picked it, you know, he had, his hands had gotten bloody. And then he went to look for his mother and he went to the garage I opened the garage door, and there's no blood on the garage door. He said, then he goes to his bedroom and turns the light switch on, and uh, there's blood on the wall. So I'm saying, well, how does blood get on the wall but doesn't get on the doorknob when he, when he turns the doorknob? And, no, uh, and he had to undo a dead, deadbolt to get into the garage. And then he went, goes and looks at his mother, looks for his mother again, and he's, he's back and forth all over the place. He couldn't keep his consistent story in terms of the amount of blood and when he got blood and when he didn't get blood on his hands. And I think that was the biggest thing that tripped him up. An expert who backed Marty's claim of a false confession was dismissed as unbelievable. Both sides called witnesses. Then came the closing arguments. After what felt like forever, the jury came back with a verdict on June 28, 1990. Marty, overcome with emotion, waited for the news that would change his life. Tears streamed down Marty's face as he entered the courtroom. 
the jury found Marty Tankliff guilty of murdering his parents. The weight of the situation crushed him, and he broke down again. He was sentenced to 50 years to life in prison. Ask the defendant, Martin Tankliff, as to count two, murder, second degree. Guilty. Yeah. How do you find, as the defendant, Martin Tankliff, as to count three, murder, second degree? Guilty. You may be seated. You may be seated, sir. The supposed killer was locked away, and the victim's family had received their justice. The detective successfully closed the case with a sense of accomplishment. But hold on a minute. If you think this ends here, you're about as wrong as the detectives were in their investigation. We've only scratched the surface of a shocking injustice that would tear a family apart and leave a teenager fighting for his life behind bars. And there's one key player in this whole mess who stayed silent. Who was the silent witness? And how would their story become the biggest twist of all? Buckle up, because the truth behind the Tankliff murders is about to take a wild turn. There isn't anybody sitting here that ever got a question asked by the police. They never talked to anybody in this room. They no. say you never even tried to talk no, to them. That's not true. Are you that's saying they're lying? True. Yes. Did you ask to speak with them and they said no? No. I never directly asked them to speak to them. I didn't have to. What were they going to add to my case? Sentenced to a life he didn't deserve, Marty clung to one desperate hope, proving his innocence. I didn't believe it at that time because I knew of the relationship between Marty and his parents. And it was inconceivable that it could have been Marty. So I, I think that, you know, as far, from physical strength, no way. Um, emotionally, no way. Um, no, it's just, it, to us, it was just impossible. Hundreds of thousands of dollars vanished into the legal fight, draining Marty's family's resources. His own sister, Sherry Mistretta, the beneficiary of their inheritance, turned her back on him completely. Devastated and isolated, Marty threw himself into studying his case, becoming an expert on every detail. He even helped other inmates with their appeals. During his time in jail, he wrote countless letters, an estimated 50,000 pleading for help. One glimmer of hope emerged in 2001, America's Most Wanted offered free DNA testing for wrongfully convicted people. This was huge. They could finally prove Marty's innocence, or so they thought. The results showed that the hair belonged to Arlene herself. This left Marty and his lawyers with a steep climb. Their best chance seemed to be finding new evidence, and for that, they needed a new set of eyes. In 2001, they decided to reach out to Jay Saltpeter a private investigator with a remarkable track record of exonerating the wrongly convicted, and Marty's story resonated deeply with him. There was another positive development as well. The lawyers who had initially taken Marty's case on a pro bono basis had all moved on to bigger firms over the years. The good news? These bigger firms were still willing to represent Marty for free. With renewed hope and a powerhouse legal team behind him, Saul Peter dug into the case files. He immediately noticed a lead that hadn't been fully explored, a woman named Carlene Kovac's story about Joe, a man who claimed to have been at the crime scene. You really believe when he said he was involved in the tank of murders that he was telling the truth? Oh yeah, definitely. He couldn't understand why this lead hadn't been pursued more aggressively. The answer was simple, money. Marty's original lawyers had run out of funds and were forced to do the best they could with limited resources. Thankfully, with the backing of these powerhouse firms, Saltpeter could finally afford to chase down every lead no matter how strange it seemed, this case, filled with heartbreak and injustice, was about to take another dramatic turn. But who was Carleen, and how did she become a key piece of the puzzle? In 1991, Carleen found herself at her sister's friend's party. The evening took a strange turn when a man named Joe, known for his involvement with drugs and a violent temper, began boasting about his connection to a shocking crime. According to Carleen, Creedon claimed to have been present during the Tankliff murders, hiding in the bushes and fleeing afterward. Carlene was stunned by this confession, but kept it to herself for months. In the same year, during a small family dinner on Easter in 1991, fate intervened when Carlene met her boss's father, Bill Navarra. He was a private investigator, but the most important detail here is that he had once worked on the Tankliff case. Finally, she revealed Joe's dark secret. It seemed suspicious that Creedon would inject himself into the case, especially since he'd previously asked Marty's lawyer, Gottlieb, to represent him in an unrelated matter. 
The DA's office investigated Joe, but unfortunately, this lead, like so many others, went cold. Could Creedon be trying to throw them off track? Or was there something more to his story? But Saul Peter wasted no time. He contacted Carlene, who seemed frustrated that no one had followed up on her information before. This time, she revealed a crucial detail she hadn't mentioned earlier. Creedon had spoken of a lot of blood at the crime scene. To solidify Carlene's story, Saul Peter had her take a lie detector test, which she passed. He even spoke with Carlene's boyfriend, who had been present during the conversation. The boyfriend claimed he hadn't heard the entire conversation, but he did recall Creedon mentioning hiding in the bushes, feeling amped up, and witnessing a card game. The pieces of the puzzle were starting to come together, but the picture remained unclear. Was Creedon a witness, or something more? Saul Peter's team wasted no time and investigated Joe's background, and what they found was unsettling. Creedon had a history of trouble with the law during his youth. These include charges for statutory rape, attempted grand theft, and a string of burglaries he committed with a young accomplice named Glenn Harris. Disturbingly, during one of these burglaries, they used a Strathmore bagel truck, a truck that belonged to Jerry Stewerman. This strange connection sent chills down everyone's spine. Could Creedon be the key to unraveling the entire case? Or was he just another dead end, another layer of mystery in this ever-tangled web? It seemed like Carlene and Creedon might hold the key, but there was another twist. Glenn Harris, the kid Creedon committed burglaries with, turned out to be the real game changer. I thought if I could do something right for somebody else, I'd be helping myself. In March 2004, Saul Peter contacted Glenn, who was now an adult in prison. Glenn wrote a lengthy letter expressing his regret over Marty's situation. He claimed to have crucial information and believed he could finally set the record straight. The most shocking part? Harris confessed to being the getaway driver for the Tankliff murders. Then he revealed that this crime was committed not just by one, but two men who were convicted felons. He claimed he thought the two men, Joe Creedon and Peter Kent, were just committing a burglary and had no idea things would turn deadly. Saul Peter saw the potential in Harris's story. Harris passed a lie detector test, adding weight to his claims. With this explosive new evidence, Saul Peter's team geared up to fight for a new trial for Marty. This case, full of twists and turns, was about to take another dramatic leap forward. Marty's lawyers presented their new evidence, including Harris's confession as a getaway driver to the DA. However, the DA wasn't convinced and even interviewed the other people Harris named who denied involvement. The team found more leads, like a rumor about Jerry Stewerman admitting to the murders. Jerry Stewerman has ties to Joseph Creighton. This is not a random hit. Another inmate claimed Jerry's son, Todd Stewerman, said his father hired some men to deal with the tank lifts. Todd was also a convicted criminal who was arrested for selling cocaine at his father's bagel store and also had connections with Joe Creedon. A key turning point came when Harris agreed to testify without immunity. He even revealed another detail. The murder weapon was a pipe. Saul Peter and Harris visited the crime scene and with a metal detector, they found a rusty pipe. Unfortunately, no DNA was recovered, but it still helped to strengthen their case. Marty's lawyer presented all their findings, including Harris's confession and the rumors about Jerry Stewerman. The prosecution focused on discrediting Harris due to his criminal past and drug problems. They also questioned Joe Creedon, one of the men Harris claimed was involved in the murders. Creedon admitted he collected debts for drug dealers, including Todd Stewerman, but denied ever meeting Jerry Stewerman. This contradicted a sworn statement he signed earlier when he claimed Jerry offered him money to drop charges against Todd. Joe's ex-girlfriend even painted a disturbing picture of him, describing him as abusive and violent. Meanwhile, Carlene stuck to her story about Creedon admitting his involvement in the murders. The big moment arrived in July 2004. Glenn Harris was supposed to testify. Unfortunately, Harris refused to answer any questions that could incriminate himself. His lawyer argued for immunity, but the judge said no. This was a huge setback for Marty's defense. Even more witnesses began to come out of the woodwork to help Marty's case. Lenny Labrano, a man who knew both Jerry Stewerman and Detective James McCready, came forward after watching a documentary about the case. His testimony revealed a previously unknown detail. Detective McCready also ran a side business in construction, and Labrano had witnessed him with Jerry when working together on a project. The defense pointed out inconsistencies in McCready's statements and a potential conflict of interest. 
The DA had previously represented McCready, and their partner had represented Jerry's family. Despite the setback, the hearing was delayed for three months, which also gave them time to find more witnesses. Marty's lawyers tracked down another witness named Bill Ram, who used to hang out with Glenn Harris, Joe Creedon, and Peter Kent. He confirmed Harris's story about all of them being together the night of the murders and had, in fact, started from his house. What were you doing that evening? I was hanging out at my house, um, had a few people over. Ram said Creedon wanted to borrow his car, but he refused to go with them. Ram said that he didn't go along with them, but Harris did. He also said Harris came by the day after the murder and mentioned Creedon and Kent freaking out after the murders. This testimony strongly supported Harris's claims. Ram even agreed to testify in court despite the potential risk to his parole. Kent, however, was not cooperative. He tried to discredit Ram by claiming Ram was paid to lie. When they bring me in, you know, they told me that we don't, we don't believe that you did this. You know, I thought maybe like they were trying to play technology games with me, you know. <laughs> yeah, Peter, we don't think that you really did it, but just come on, come forward, you know. I know I was not there with Glenn doing no murders. Kent also had an alibi for the night of the murders, but it didn't hold up under scrutiny. He claimed he was involved in a robbery later that night. Kent's testimony was filled with self-serving lies and attempts to shift blame to others. On the other hand, during the trial, Marty's family was heartbroken. They just wanted justice for Marty and for him to finally come home. It had been a long, hard wait, and they were desperate for good news. Just when hope seemed to be fading completely, a surprise witness emerged, offering a glimmer of light in the darkest hour. This unexpected hero was none other than Joe Grazio, the 17-year-old son of Joe Creedon, the very man suspected of playing a key role in Marty's nightmare. Away from his father for most of his life, Joe Gracio had only recently reconnected with his father. Initially, things seemed positive, but as their bond grew, the son began to learn about his father's dark past, a past that sent shivers down his spine. One day, Joe Jr. stumbled upon a hidden room in his father's house. There, his father showed him stolen goods, a case overflowing with jewels, stacks of cash piled high. He promised Joe Jr. anything he desired if he left his mother and came to live with him. But the true weight of his father's darkness struck Joe Jr. when he decided to ask about the Tankliff murders. Dad, you know, tell me, did you really do this? He tells me, yes, I did do it. For several months, young Joe says he kept to himself what his father said. When he finally told his mother, she convinced him to testify and called private detective J. Sal Peter. He also showed his son a bag filled with menacing tools, a gun, a pair of handcuffs and ankle shackles, and said that these were for Glenn Harris if he ever got any ideas about confessing. But there was one problem. The assistant DA, Leonard Leto, believed that all the people who confessed against Joe Creedon were merely just lashing out. Like the people who implicated Creedon, they all admitted one thing. Uh, they all hated him. That's a reason to say things about a person that isn't true. After all this time, after all these confessions, could they all be wrong? For years, Marty maintained his innocence, and finally, a glimmer of hope arrived in January 2007. Marty's lawyers submitted a powerful appeal with backing from former prosecutors and legal experts. Finally, on December 21, 2007, after nearly seven years of appeals and 17 years in prison, the good news came. Marty's conviction was overturned. However, freedom wasn't immediate. Marty spent another agonizing six days behind bars but his spirit remained unbroken as the fight wasn't over. The Suffolk County District Attorney declined to retry Marty, but wouldn't reopen the case. In a surprising turn of events, New York Governor Spitzer stepped in and appointed Attorney General Andrew Como to take a fresh look at the investigation. While Marty waited, he didn't waste time. He enrolled at Hofstra University, his parents' alma mater, to pursue his education. He studied philosophy and sociology, and even delved into the legal aspects of his case. Finally, on June 30, 2008, after a thorough review, Attorney General Como announced that while some evidence pointed towards Marty, it was insufficient to convict him beyond a reasonable doubt. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you. All charges were dropped, and Marty wouldn't be retried. On July 22, 2008, Marty was officially a free man. Justice, though delayed by two decades, had finally prevailed. But now it was Marty's turn to take people to court.
Jerry Stroom was my father's business partner. Uh, Joseph Creedon was an enforcer for his son's drug business. Glenn Harris was the getaway driver, and Peter Kent was another person involved. Can you fight for a rightful conviction in this case? Uh, my family and I will not stop till there's justice for my parents. In 2009, he filed a lawsuit against the state of New York and the Suffolk County Police Department for a wrongful conviction. He was determined to make a difference and so pursued his dream of becoming a lawyer. Love found him, too. While speaking about his wrongful incarceration at a Long Island college, he met his future wife, Lori. They married in 2010 and have built a beautiful life together with their daughter. Marty graduated from Truro Law School in 2014, and this was also the year he received his settlements acknowledging the injustice he'd faced. His dedication was undeniable, and in 2020, he was officially admitted to the New York State Bar. His passion for justice led him to even become a defense attorney at Metcalf & Metcalf. Now a lawyer at Metcalf & Metcalf, Marty continues to fight for justice, recently being admitted to the prestigious U.S. Second Circuit Court of Appeals in February 2021. Surrounded by his wife Lori and his stepdaughter, Marty's story is one of resilience and the triumph of the human spirit. While Marty Tancliffe eventually rebuilt his life, the stories of those who wronged him don't offer as neat an ending. You know, money has no bearing on my life. Uh, obtaining my freedom and finding out the truth is what's important. As you sit here today, what do you think of Sherry Roper? Not much. There's not much to think. Because she contested the estate? Because she contested the estate, because she threw a party after she got her share of the money to celebrate. You know, obtaining money from the death of my father and having a party is disgusting. You know, it's been said, Sherry, that you went into business uh, with Jimmy McCready. Mm -hmm. Is that a fact? Absolutely not. I did not. My ex-husband went into business with Jim McCready. I even expressed to him my, my concern and uh, my trepidation about his doing that. He wanted to do it anyway, and so he did. Was any of your money used to, to construct the restaurant? Yeah, actually it was my money, um, but that was my husband at the time. And um, I, uh, <laughs> you know, I did what I felt that I had to do to try and salvage my disintegrating marriage, I guess. And a bartender friend of mine, um, he, I had asked him to come into the business with me because I really didn't know much about the business. Well, it turned out that he was friends with Ronnie Rotha. And one night in a conversation between the three of us, it was Ronnie kind of asked if he could get in and, and involved in it. And we thought it would be a good idea because we thought he was a good businessman. And, uh, and that's how the whole thing developed. But so, uh, Sherry had nothing to do with it. But, but Sherry told us that her money was used by Ronnie. Uh, very, very, very possible. Uh, you know, very possible. But Sherry had nothing to do with the business. So she, you didn't consider yourself to be partners with, with Sherry? Her? No, not at all. Jerry Stewerman, the man Marty believed to be the true culprit, never faced charges and continued to see his bagel business flourish. By 1994, with the help of his son, his chain had grown to 30 stores. Justice seemed to have eluded him entirely, as he eventually retired comfortably in Boca Raton with his second wife. Detective McCready, the officer whose pressured interrogation led to Marty's false confession, passed away in 2015. A dark cloud hung over Marty's case from the very beginning. Detective James McCready used questionable tactics. Marty alleges McCready fed him lies and pressured him into a confession. Adding to the confusion, Marty's father tragically never confessed to Marty's guilt. It was all lies. Disturbingly, McCready had a history of being untruthful under oath. Furthermore, he obtained an unusually high number of confessions. These red flags raising serious doubts about truthfulness of the evidence. Statistics paint an even more troubling picture. The area where Marty's case unfolded had a staggering 94% confession rate in 1988, far exceeding national averages. This raised serious questions about the validity of the confessions themselves. But McCready claimed otherwise. So were these confessions coerced, or worse, manufactured? Marty endured 17 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Despite losing his youth in prison, his hope and the work of his supporters led to his release. But the sad part is that the true culprits behind the Tankliff murder may forever remain a haunting mystery. We hope this video sparked your curiosity. Share your thoughts in the comments below. Which case would you like us to explore next? 
Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to Mysterious 7 for more captivating true crime content. Your support fuels our passion to bring you these stories. Until next time, stay curious.